All right, good morning, church, and happy Easter, happy Resurrection Sunday. Uh, you can see I've dressed a little bit extra for the occasion today uh, as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, today we're taking a break from our normal text, okay? So we're not going to be the book of Acts today. We're actually going to take a break from that sermon series, the year-long sermon series, Live Out Loud, going through the book of Acts. And we're going to take a breather today, and we're going to look at a resurrection text today and focus on victory, because the title of the sermon is Victory in Jesus, and that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the victory that we have in Jesus, and the text for today is going to be uh, partially uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So if you would, go ahead and turn in your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, it's going to be a bit before we get there because i got a lot to share with you, but 1 Corinthians chapter 15. While you're turning there, let me just share a little bit with, with you about this, this concept of victory, uh, and that is quite simply that we like to win, don't we? I, I mean, let, let's face it, there's something innate in us uh, that we like to win. We're, we gravitate toward winners. I mean, if you go to a sporting goods store, you are, you're not going to want to buy the football jersey of the guy who single-handedly lost the Super Bowl for your team, right? You're not going to want to do that. It's just, it's just, it's bad business. You're not going to wear that jersey. We want to wear the clothing of winners. And so you wouldn't do that. And, and listen, women, I, I kind of understand, listen, I mean, I know guys, look, we say we root for the underdog or we love, you know, we, we, our heart goes out to the losers, but honestly, we, we really are all about winning. I mean, for real, we love a victory. And ladies, I know, this is really something that guys probably are, are geared towards more so than yourselves, and that's not 100% the case, but, but let me share a little bit of the, of the male psyche with you to help you understand men, okay? This is some free uh, marriage counseling advice right here for you, okay? Here is a fact. Like it or not, this is a fact, okay? Everything in life is a competition for men, Okay, everything, everything is. Let me give you a perfect example. I was at Lowe's a couple days ago. I only had to go in to pick up two items, but I walked around for about 20 minutes, couldn't find what I was looking for, uh, and I caught, you know, I got a call from Shannon, um, and she said, well, you know, just go ask someone. And that was my response. Like, what, are you crazy? We don't go ask someone. No, it might take me two hours, but I'm going to find what I'm looking for in this store because I'm going to go do it because I'm not going to give in. You see, if I go ask the 16-year-old boy working at the, uh, uh, at the lumber counter where to find something, I've already lost. <laughs> okay, so, so guys, you understand what I'm saying. You're like, yeah, yeah, that's right. Women, you probably don't get it. That's okay. It's just part of who we are as guys. But overall, listen, we love to win. We do. We love the victory. And so I want to talk to you today about victory and victory in Jesus. In fact, that word victory is used 39 times throughout the Bible. Five of those times you're going to see, them, see those, that word used in the New Testament. Now take that and put that in your back pocket because we're going to come back to that a little bit later, okay? The New Testament uses, at least three, not five, all five, but three of those. So put those in your back pocket because we're going to start over here in the Old Testament and we're going to work through a little bit. Now, I'm not going to give you 34 examples of victory from the Old Testament. I don't want to take that long today. Um, I want you to be able to spend time with your family and loved ones today and enjoy and celebrate the resurrection of our, of our Lord Savior Jesus today, okay? But to get started, I just want to take a few looks at this concept of victory as found in the Bible. Now, if you look through and you do a study on victory, you're going to find 80% of the time there's a warning label attached to it. God says the victory will be mine or the victory is uh, is God's or victory is given to the Lord. 80% of the time, it has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with your army or your strength or your might or your intelligence or your strategy or anything whatsoever. It's all about God. And I want to share three specific examples with you. Some of my favorite examples from the Old Testament of God stepping in and giving the victory when it seems absolutely like there's no way in the world there would be a victory from that, but God gives the victory. So the first example I want to share with you is uh, Joshua. Joshua and the battle at Jericho. Just put yourself in this guy's sandals for a moment. Joshua is a general. He's a military leader. Leader. He's very strong. He's very courageous. Uh, he is a bold guy. He's a strategist. He's very good with military strategy. And there's just a day where God just says, hey, you know those guys over there in that city? 
surrounded by that wall? Go get him. And Joshua says, all right, let's go get him. What's the plan, God? And God says, okay, well, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take all your people, and I want you to line them up in a straight line. And already from a military strategic kind of a concept that doesn't make sense, and you know Joshua's just got to be thinking, wait a minute, no, 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 this doesn't work this way, but, but he's probably going with it. All right, line all your people up in a nice straight line, and he says, okay, what next? He says, put all your priests in the front, in the front of the line. And again, you got to be thinking, no, this is not how we go into battle. This is not definitely not how we win a battle. Uh, but okay, wh what do we do next, God? And God says, well, when you get your people all lined up in a straight line, you get your priests in the front of the line, then here's what I want you to do. I want you to just stay quiet and walk around the city walls. Just do that one time. It's really going to freak them out. Now, again, <laughs> try to put yourself in Joshua's sandals for a moment. This doesn't sound like this is something that's going to work. It doesn't sound like uh, it's going to be feasible. Maybe he's even thinking, gosh, can the ladies even stay quiet walking around the entire wall? <laughs> okay. Oh, I can almost hear the groans from the living rooms right now. Ladies, I love you. That was a bad joke. I'm sorry. But, but he's got to be thinking, there's no way in the world. This doesn't make sense. This isn't going to work. So, so after we do this and we walk around the city, then what? And God says, well, then go home. And then come back the next day and do it again. In fact, I want you to come back and do this six days in a row. Come out here, line the people up in a straight line, put all the priests in the front, and then silently I want you to just walk around the city one time, walk around the city walls, and then go home. Now this had to be difficult for, for Joshua. I mean, just think about this, guys. He's a, he's a military general. He's, he's very good with strategy, right? He's, he, he's a fighter, and to walk around the city walls and just to have these, these soldiers standing at the top of the walls and mocking them as they walk around, I mean, it had to be demoralizing for them. In fact, it probably sounded a lot like this. Take a listen. What are you doing? We're going to knock your wall down. By walking around in circles? Yes. It's not because we're crazy or anything. Our God told us to do it this way. Oh, that's a great idea. You go ahead and keep walking. Keep walking. But you will knock down our wall. Keep walking. But she isn't gonna fall. It's plain to see. Your brains are very small to think walking. We'll be knocking down our wall. <laughs> That's probably what it was like. Very discouraging, mocking and ridiculing him as he's just walking around the city thinking, okay, this is your plan, God, this is what we're going to do. But then he says, look, here's the deal. On the seventh day... That's when we unleash the secret weapon and the walls fall down. Now, you got to be like, Joshua's got to be like, okay, <sighs> give it to me, Lord. What's the secret weapon? What do we got? What do we got? Tanks? Rocket launchers? Cannons? Atom bombs? What are we going to do? What, what's the secret weapon? What's this going to be? And God says, horns. And you got to be thinking, horns? What, <laughs> what in the world? How does this work? He says, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna line up all your people, you're going to put the priests in the front, and you're going to give every one of your priests a horn, and this time you're going to march around the city walls seven times. And then at the end of the seventh time, then the people are going to shout, and the priests are going to blow their horns, and, and the walls are just going to fall. Now, now, Joshua, you got to love this guy. I mean, honestly, he's got to be thinking, really, my, my victory is in the hands of, of <laughs> tooting priests? <laughs> tooting priests that's what we get that's what that's what happens but that's exactly what happened guys it doesn't seem logical does it but God gave the victory and I love that because it's it's a perfect example of when when the the world seems to be against you at odds that are just outstanding and innumerable God gives the victory and so that was one of my favorites but my next favorite one oh my goodness Joshua was really great, but, but go to Judges. Judges chapter chapters 4 and 5, and, and you read about Deborah and this guy named Barak. Oh, man, what a cool name, Barak. Now, he's, he's again, he's a military general. He's a leader, and uh, he's got a cool name. I just got to say, Barak, this just sounds cool. He's just, he, he sounds like that Saturday morning cartoon hero, right? Can you just picture this guy? I am Barak. Defender of all that is good. Right? I mean, it's got a good echo even in here. I mean, 
Bayrak. It's a cool name. Now, he's not so cool uh, as you're going to see, but, but he's got this cool name. Now, Deborah is, is a messenger from, uh, from God, one of the messengers that, that God speaks to, and he gives her a message. Go tell Barak to go fight the Canaanites. They've been oppressing my people for 20 years. I want them to go and wipe them out. I want this to be done and over with. So Deborah goes to see Barak, and, he sa- and she says, Barak. I don't know that she sounded like that, but that would be cool. I mean, he's got a cool name, Barak. I, need, I love saying that name. You need to go over there. The Lord said, go defeat those Canaanites. Go get them. And so Barak, right? Barak says, well, I'll go if you go. Only, you know, you come with me. I, I mean, just... This is just sad. I'm sorry. Now, now, ladies, nothing against you at all. But honestly, you, you, in those times, in those days, you didn't bring a woman into battle with you. You just did not do that. But she says, hey, well, I'll go because I know you need to do this. And because the Lord said to go do it, I'll go with you so you can do it and you can get it done. So, so Barak says, all right, all right, so we're ready to go. Lord, what's the plan? What are we going to do? And God says, okay, I want you to go over to Mount Tabor. I want you to go climb up the mountain, take 10,000 troops with you, climb up to the top of the mountain and stay there and wait until the enemy approaches. And and then you're going to have victory. And Barak's like, you got him, right? You got him? God, you got him? You got this? And God's like, I got this. Barak's like, okay, what are you going to do? And God says, ha ha, I'm going to make it rain. Now Barak's got me thinking, ooh, rain, um... Oh, we're we gonna melt these guys. I mean, I, what's the deal now? Now, <laughs> here's kind of something funny. This guy Barak is afraid of the other guy, the enemy. This guy's name is. Are you ready for it? Sisera. <laughs> it almost sounds like sissy in the guy's name, and he's afraid of him. Barak is afraid of Sisera, but this guy Sisera, though, you gotta you gotta give him credit. The guy has nine hundred iron chariots. That's pretty impressive. And so he's got a guy riding on each one of these chariots. So they're going to come and circle the mountain. All right, Barak's up on top with 10,000 troops hanging out, waiting. Now, as the enemy approaches, you know, it, it, it probably gets a little bit dicey. But God sends the rain. And it rains. And it rains. Now, now listen, you're talking 900 chariots plus an army, okay? 10,000 men that Barak has going against 900 chariots and an army of men as well. And so, uh, you know, there's nowhere to go. Barak's got to at least be thinking, man, if we're at the top of the mountain and they just kind of keep coming up the mountain, there's no retreat for us, right? I mean, because that makes sense. As a, as a guy, as a military general, as a strategist, that's not a good strategy. But he goes along with it, and as the enemy approaches, God sends the rain, and it rains, and it rains, and it rains, and it's coming down. It's this torrential downpour, and what happens is the ground gets really soft, and all these chariots begin to just sink down into the ground, and, and they're over here, and they're, it's really cool. They're getting stuck in the mud, and, and the soldiers are having a tough time as well with the rain, just, just being able to navigate through all of this. And all Barak has to do is take his men, just come down the mountain, just thump those guys on the head, game over. And that's essentially what happens, but this guy, Sisera, he gets away from the battle. He goes to a tent, okay, to, to one of the homes of, of someone that he's good friends with, someone that he, uh, he works with and does business with. That guy is gone, but his wife is home, JL. Now listen, God said, all right, he, he told Barak, I need you to go do this. Barak said, well, I'll go, Deborah, if you go with me. And Deborah said, okay, but the Lord has given the victory to a woman. Keep that in mind, because you're probably thinking Deborah, but that's not the case. Now, He goes, Sisera goes to this tent. The husband is gone, but his wife is there, this lady named JL. Now, this is JL with a (laughs) nail. If you know the story, hopefully you laughed at that. If not, you're going to get it in just a moment. Uh, Because with JL, you'll get the point. Trust me, you're (laughs) you're about to find out. So, so Sisera shows up and he says, oh my gosh, okay, here's the deal. Uh, I just, uh, I'm going to stay here and hide out. If someone comes to the tent, tell them I'm not here. So she gets him some milk to drink, and he drinks that, and then he lays down, she covers him up, and she goes back over to the entrance of the tent, and she keeps watch, and this guy, Sisera, falls asleep, and while he is sleeping, JL grabs a tent peg, right, a nail, and she grabs a mallet, and she goes over, and she drives that that tent peg through his temple, through his skull, okay, through his skull, and kills him. 
Now, you just got to understand. You, that's what I mean. You'll get the point. With JL, you'll get the point, <laughs> all right? Now, when Hubby gets home, he's got to be thinking, I'm not cool with a dead body in the middle of the living room, but <laughs> it's okay, baby. I ain't going to argue with you. It's all good, right? So so God gave the victory. Again, you, you, you don't think that it would happen with the way it stacks up, but it just doesn't make sense. But God gave the victory. And then I want to share with you my absolute favorite example, and that's Gideon. Oh, man, I love this one. Gideon, you talk about military strategy. Gideon has 36,000 men. He's going to go up and go against the Midianites. Now, here's the deal with the Midianites. They are an international army. That is, they have people groups from different uh, areas of the known world coming together to form this army. And this army is massive, massive. In fact, the Bible says this, that the army was so large that it was like locusts in the field that could not be numbered. In fact, it goes on to say that even their camels could not be numbered. Now that's serious. Now listen, here, here, here's the deal. I could understand going into battle and getting thumped by someone and, and trying to like scraggle out of the battlefield and, and, and barely survive. That, that's one thing, but getting run over by a camel? Man, I mean, just could you imagine? You, you crawl on the ground, right? And someone says, hey, what happened? And you're like, dude, I got run over by a camel. And the guy laughs, ha, 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 you got thumped by a hump, <laughs> right? It's just not a good way to go. But, but anyway, so, so this is a massive army. And Gideon is here with 10,000 men. And the Lord says, you got too many. Right, excuse me, excuse me. He's here with 36,000 men. And he says, you got too many. So what I want you to do is I want you to let everybody know. Just tell all the men there, anyone who's afraid, they can go home. No, no harm, no foul, no problems, no, no hard feelings. If they're afraid, they can go home. So, so Gideon stands up. He, he dresses all of his men, says, if you're afraid, you can go home. It's all good. No hard feelings. And listen, <laughs> 36,000 men are there. 10,000 are left. 26,000 men left, 10,000 are left. Now, are these guys brave? Oh, yeah. Are they smart? I don't know about that. Because if they weren't afraid then, uh, with, you know, they should be afraid now, right? 10,000 of them left. And, and again, Gideon, even in the midst of that, should have been thinking, 36,000, God, that's not even enough to go against these guys. They outnumber us probably by 10 or even 20 times this. And God says, no, it's too many. You got to thin them out. The ones that are afraid, tell them to go home. So he says, okay, anyone who are afraid, go home. 27,000 of them are afraid, and they go home. He's here now with 10,000 guys. And he says, all right, 10,000, this is, there's no way this is going to happen, Lord. And God says, no, no, I got this. But you still got too many men. So, so you need to thin them out a little bit. Go down to the river, and I want you to thin them out. And do this. Everyone that, that scoops water up into their hand and drinks it from their hand, you keep those guys. All of the ones that dip their faces in the water like a dog and drink like a dog, you send those guys home. So that's what, that's what Gideon does, and he's left with 300 men. And God says, yeah, now we're ready to go. And Gideon's got to be thinking, no way. 300, they probably got 100 times this many men uh, out there just ready and waiting for us. How are we going to do this? And God says, I've got a great plan. And here's what you're going to do. You're going to take your 300 men and you're going to surround the enemy. <laughs> now, just kind of just understand now that that's probably equivalent to one man every 100 yards or so, okay? Massive enemy encampment, massive amount of soldiers there, okay? He says, I want you to wait until they're all sleeping. And then your men are going to have three items, three items. And, and you know, Gideon's probably thinking, okay, yeah, uh, uh, machine gun, uh, flamethrower, right, rocket launcher. No, none of those. God says your, your men are going to each have all of these three things. They're going to have a clay pot. They're going to have a torch, and they're going to have a horn. And, and, and he says, here's what you're going to do. You're going to surround the camp, and when they're all sleeping, your men are going to light their torches. They're going to break the jars and then they're going to all blow into their horns all at the same time. And then they're going to shout, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Okay? It, and, and it's going to work. Now, now it sounds great, right? But you just, you got to know there's, there's got to be at least one guy. At least one guy in the crowd, right? Because this is a bluff. It's a total bluff, 100%. But there's got to be one guy standing there, you know, just saying like, uh... Yeah, excuse me, sir, uh, I ain't too bright and all, but <laughs> uh, 
Well, what if they don't go for it? Right? I mean, <laughs> it's a bluff. What if they don't buy it? Probably a really good question. I imagine somebody must have thought of. But they go out. It's dark. They wait for the enemies to go to sleep. They're sleeping, most of them. And then Joshua, or not Joshua, sorry, Gideon gives the signal, and the men are all spaced about, well, they're surrounding the camp, whatever that looked like, 100 yards, 200 yards apart. They all light their torches. They break the jars, and they all blow in their horns super loud, and then they all shout, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And what happens is these men come rushing out of their tents. They wake up. They're not sure what's going on. They're rubbing their eyes. They're looking around, and everyone, listen, everyone in the camp starts yelling in their native language and there's mass confusion and so they hear a native language and they start fighting against each other and they kill each other and Gideon has to be standing there saying ha it won or it worked my goodness we won because guys it doesn't seem possible does it that seems just like a really ridiculous situation but God gave the victory and that's the point is that God gives the victory. Listen, I know some of you with this coronavirus going on, I know some of you are really struggling at home right now. You know, you're, you're kind of locked in and quarantined. You don't get out much at all. And, and, and maybe because of that, with a lack of social interaction, and we don't have church now really to attend on Sunday. So, so again, that becomes difficult. Small groups are on hold as well. Maybe you get down into a little bit of a slump and you start feeling like, man, I just, I just don't feel... I just don't feel like, like the Lord is, is, is strong in my life. I just don't feel His presence. It just, just not feeling it. And maybe you're even thinking, man, maybe I should just give up. But I want you to know, I don't want you to give up. And God doesn't want you to give up because, listen, He didn't give up. Okay, I can imagine Gideon standing there with 300 men going against this massive army that couldn't even be numbered and thinking, what in the world are we doing? But he, get, he, he went in with faith, trusting the Lord, and the victory was given because God gives the victory. And guys, listen, I, I need you to understand, this is not your fight. This is the Lord's battle. We are his church. And whatever you're going through, he's got this. Give it to him and he will give you strength and he will give you peace and he will give you the victory. Because I know some of you are really struggling right now and you're probably feeling like, gosh, I just don't know if God knows where I live anymore, but he does. I want you to be assured of that, okay? And I wanna share with you just a few, a few more examples of, of the victory that we already have. Remember I told you there were five examples from the New Testament? Well, I want you to go ahead and turn now uh, to that 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You should already be there. And I want to share with you not five, but I want to share with you three, three uses of that word victory in the text. And this is a resurrection text for us, guys. This is good stuff for us, okay? So if you're ready, let's go ahead and read this together. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 54b. That's the end of verse 54, okay? This is what we read. Death has been swallowed up in victory. There's the first use. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? There's the second. Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. 57. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory. There's the third one. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. I love that. God gives us the victory. Uh, I, I, I just, we, have a, we have victory in the New Testament. It has a name. It's Jesus. We have victory in Jesus. Now, now the really cool thing is, now listen, don't, don't lose me on this one. If you take the name of Jesus, which is, which is Greek, and you translate it into the Hebrew, it sounds like this, Yeshua. And that's the word in the Old Testament used for victory. Isn't that awesome? In the Old Testament and the New Testament, we have a name for victory, and it's Jesus. And that is, that is our, our coming Messiah that one day is going to be riding on the clouds soon and very soon and riding on the clouds and coming back and, and, and he's going to secure victory when he returns. That's the guy that we are celebrating to, today, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He gives the victory. Now listen, that victory, there's a battle that takes place. What I want to do is, is I want to share with you an example from Revelation chapter 19. Okay, so if you would, go ahead and turn there, please. While you're turning to Revelation 19, and trust me, guys, it will all make sense, okay? While you're turning there, I just want to share with you what you're about to see, okay? Jesus has, has, um, 
is standing there. He's dressed. He's ready for battle, okay? The battle line has been drawn. Jesus is standing here on this side, and over on this side are the enemies of God, okay? So you've got Jesus over here. His eyes are like blazing fire, okay? He's got a, a sword that's coming out of his mouth. He has a robe. He's wearing a robe that's been dipped in blood, and on his thigh is tattooed his name, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And if you don't like tattoos, you're not going to like his body piercings. And he's standing on this side of the battle lines. On this side, you have the dragon, the beast, and the harlot, and then behind them, all the enemies of God, the kings of the earth, all the enemies. Now, they're probably standing there trash-talking Jesus because we still even see that today, right? The enemies of God will trash-talk the church, trash-talk God, trash-talk Jesus and Christians. So that's probably going on over here, and many people believe this is the battle of Armageddon, but I don't. I don't believe there's a battle of Armageddon. I honestly don't. I want to show you from the text, not just because of my own personal belief, but I want to show you from the text there's no battle at Armageddon. There's no battle whatsoever. It just doesn't happen, okay? And if you don't believe me, I, I want to share with you why I believe this, okay? No battle at Armageddon. You've got Jesus lined up over here. He's ready to go. You've got the enemies lined up over here, uh, the, the dragon, the beast, the harlot, and then all the kings of the earth and the enemies. They're all lined up. Everyone is ready. The battle lines have been drawn, and then you know something is about to happen, and then verse 20, Revelation 19, verse 20, you know something's going to happen. But the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf. <laughs> the beast was captured. Everybody's lined up, they're ready to go, they're lined up and ready for battle, and there's no battle. There's nothing that takes place. The beast was captured. It's like no one had time to draw a sword. No one had time to draw a bow. They didn't have time to sweat. Jesus just walks up and says, Bam! You're dead. It's over. Game over. It's all done. There's no battle. Uh, it's more like a massacre of Armageddon. I can go for that. Because that's exactly what happened. Now, if, you, if you're okay with PG-13 reading, you can read through the, the remainder of the text. And it says that the, the birds of the air began to, to feast on their flesh which is gruesome, but it's also awesome because God gives the, he gives the, uh, the victory, guys. It, it wasn't, there's no battle there, none whatsoever. It was so one-sided, it's pathetic. It'd be like Hulk Hogan uh, against Pee Wee Herman. Pee Wee Herman, if you're listening, I apologize. It'd be like the WWF going against the uh, uh, local high school badminton team. There's no competition whatsoever. Jesus walks out and says, boom, you're dead and it's over. 100% done. No battle. No battle. Massacre? Yeah. Yeah. No battle Armageddon. There is a battle that's, that's mentioned in the book of Revelation, though, but it's not chapter 19. It's in chapter 12. Turn to chapter 12. We're going to conclude with this this morning. Revelation chapter 12. There's a battle that takes place. This is the only time in scripture where God bleeds. He's never going to do it again. As you're turning to chapter 12, let me just share with you what you're going to see. When, when the chapter opens up, you have this pregnant woman. She's nine months pregnant. She's about ready to give birth. Okay, and in front of her is this dragon. And this dragon is just, he's drooling. He's foaming at the mouth because he wants human flesh. That's what he wants. He wants to devour this baby as soon as it is born. But what happens is God steps in and takes the baby and rescues it and takes it out to the wilderness, out into the desert. The dragon is mad. He's really ticked off at this. So what he does is he goes up to heaven and he starts a battle between Michael and all the other angels. And they fight and they fight and they fight and they fight. And finally Satan, the dragon, is kicked out of heaven. Now many people, Christians, scholars, authors, preachers, believe that this is talking about this time way over here before the Garden of Eden. But I don't think it is. You got to remember, John is the one who's given this, uh, this vision, this revelation. And John puts this exactly where it needs to be, 33 AD at Golgotha, at the cross of Jesus Christ. And let me share with you why I believe that. It's actually Revelation chapter 12. Let's read it. Verse 10 says this. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters 
who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. Verse 11, he's been hurled down. Now verse 11, they triumphed over him. How? By the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. By the blood of the lamb at Golgotha, at the cross. That's when it happened. That's when, it, when our victory was sealed, guys. Listen, if you want to be encouraged today, be encouraged by this. Victory is not something in front of us. It's something that we cling to. It's right here. It's right now. It's something that we all already have. And listen, I know some of you guys, you're just slugging through every day. You're doing the best you can to just get through each moment and every day. And in a spiritual sense, it just feels like you've, you've got a lot of cuts and bruises and, and there's a lot of pain in your walk right now. And, and, and others of you, you're going through some, some very difficult times right now with your family. And it feels like in a spiritual sense, you've got like, like festering blisters and you just don't like it and it doesn't feel like you can even get up and and take a breath and and just breathe underneath it all and you don't want to do this and and some of you might be wondering why should I just not even just stop why should I just throw in the towel and quit why why don't I give up and I want you to know this you don't give up because he did not give up you don't quit because he did not quit The victory is not the end of the race. The victory is right now because our victory walks alongside of us. It's Jesus and he walks with us through the tribulations of our lives. Amen? I hope I got an amen out of that. Guys, let me close with this. In 1968, the Olympics were held in Mexico City. And there was the last event of the Olympics... Uh, the Olympics was the, uh, the marathon, 26-mile race, 26.3, something like that. But anyways, 26-mile race, it's the marathon, typically held at the end, okay? What happened was you had this Ethiopian guy who actually won. He took first place. Now, listen, Ethiopia did not get a lot of medals, so this was a really, really big deal for, for his country. So as he's running and he's coming into, he's running through the, the, the tunnel and coming into the stadium, people are up on their feet. They're cheering. Of course, his nationality, they're all cheering and celebrating, and, and he wins. Now, this is a big deal for Ethiopia. He wins. Now, as he's on the podium receiving the gold medal for the first place, His flag is being raised in the air. Their national anthem is being played. He's very proud. He's very, very proud and very happy about that victory. And so, of course, are his nation, right, his people. But almost everybody was really, really impressed. And they were proud of this guy, you know, for doing what he did. Again, Ethiopia didn't win a lot of medals. But he went out and he won. Now, an hour later, when the lights were off, and most everybody had left the stadium, the guy who took last place was just getting there. And this guy was from Tanzania, and he, uh, he, he got hurt, he got injured on the, on the course. Uh, hit, one of his legs was very badly uh, hurt. He, he spent most of his time limping, um, walking, uh, a little bit of jogging, a little bit of running, um, and it took him a long time. Again, an hour after the first place winner, which is really, really intense. He comes limping into the tunnel and he starts to walk through the tunnel and it's all dark and he comes into the stadium and the lights are off. And and again, like I said, most of the people were gone, but there were some there and they would stand up and they would start applauding as he was coming in because they wanted to support this guy and encourage him. And he came walking along and again, a little bit of walk, a little bit of hobble, a little bit of jog um, and he, he crossed the finish line. Last place, more than an hour after the first place winner. And there was a reporter there and this guy asked him, why, why did you keep going? You were injured and, and no one expected you to, to finish this race. In fact, no one believed you would do it. You didn't have to. Why in the world did you do it? And he said, well, because listen, my country didn't send me 5,000 miles here to start a race. They sent me 5,000 miles here to finish a race. And that's exactly what he did. But guys, there was one more runner who ran that race injured. And he cried out, it is finished. See, some of you are running well right now. You are. Things are good. Uh, job is good. Health is good. Family good. Everything seems to be good right now. You're, you're running very well. Spiritually, you're strong. You're confident. Uh, you're, you're a servant of Jesus. You're, you're an example of Jesus. Things are very good. You're running very well. But for others of you, You're limping along, and every step gives you excruciating pain. 
And with every step, you, you question, why? Why should I keep going? Why should I not just quit and give up right now? And the answer is because Jesus didn't quit. And he doesn't want you to quit. And listen, I want you to understand he never gave up. The author and the perfecter of the course is right there with you. He's not at the finish line waiting for you to get there. He's running alongside of you. He's walking alongside of you. He's right there with you, step for step, stride for stride. And he's encouraging you constantly, every moment, with every breath. He's saying, take another step. Keep moving. Don't quit. Don't stop. Don't give up. That's the victory. Guys, it's not in front of you. It's right there with you. Listen, he's not, he's not even asking you to finish strong. He's not even asking you. He's not asking you to win the race. Because, guys, he's already done that. He's just asking you to finish the race. Not even finish strong, but just finish the race. Because our victory, guys, it's not something that's in front of us. It's not in the future. Our victory is here. It is now. Our victory has a name. It's Jesus Christ. And our victory, guys, is in our resurrected Savior, our Savior who is alive today, Jesus, our victory. Yeah. Guys, let's go ahead and pray. Father, I thank you for, again, another moment to be able to be here, to share your message, to share your word with your people, to bring glory to your son, Jesus. Father, I pray that right now as people hear this message, as we get to the end of this, that they would have hearts and minds opened. Uh, communion meditation is coming up in just a moment from Roy. I pray, Father, that we, we would settle our spirits and settle our minds and we would prepare ourselves for that, um, that meditation, for that word, uh, again, from you. Father, I pray that we take this message, Father, that we live it, that we share it, that we have victory, that we embrace that, uh, that whatever comes our way, God, whatever battle it is, whatever insurmountable odds come against us, Father, that we can trust in you because the victory is yours. And praise God that we are in Christ Jesus and that we have the victory through Jesus, our Savior, our victor, our resurrected King. Father, lead us and guide us. Bless us in, in all we do and say it so that we, we bring glory to your name and that you are lifted up. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Guys, I love you. Stay tuned. Uh, Roy has a communion meditation for you real quick. Be prepared for that. Prepare yourself for that. And guys, I hope to see you guys really, really soon again. Again, I love you guys. Take care. Good morning. I miss seeing you, each one of you, each time that uh, we come together, especially at this time of Easter when we remember Jesus' ultimate sacrifice of his life uh, for our sins. As you can see, our church building is empty, but God's church is alive and thriving because we are his people, we are his church. We are together, uh, and in Ephesians 4.4 4, we read, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. There's one body and one spirit, just as we read. This is one time when we're all together as one with all Christians around the world, and that is when we partake of the communion or the Lord's Supper. We may be separated by distance and time, but we're together in spirit. We're going through an anxious time right now. Fear has been pandemic with this uh, epidemic that we're having. Anxiety and fear are the chief enemy of peace. Jesus frees us from anxiety and frees us from the fear of suffering uh, and with, through his peace through prayer. In Christ, our hearts and minds are guarded safe and secure from every threat to peace. In 1 John 4.18, we read, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. What better way to eliminate fear than this time of communion when we are one with Christ, who is perfect and is our perfect love? Shall we go to God in prayer? We thank you, Heavenly Father, for being with us at this time. We know that uh, as each of us are here in spirit, that we too can worship your son in spirit. 
We ask you might be with us as we partake of the cup and of the loaf as they represent his blood and body. And that as we do, we know that we have a peace that will overtake everything in the world and a peace that is of no match. We ask you might be with us as we continue to worship you in our own ways, in our own homes, that we continue to pray to you, that we continue to lift those up uh, that is in our family uh, and all those that are in the body of our family. We ask all these things in your son's name.